Okay, let me go ahead and start here. Okay, where we left off, we were actually looking at the issue of assigning materials, and we looked at a couple of different ways to do it. We could assign the materials by object category. The big point was really that if we had no material, things would show up in gray, but you could assign materials to each of the different object categories that would show up as the default material if things weren't assigned at a deeper level. We can go down one step further and really assign them on individual types. That's actually a nice way to do it. The big thing you have to remember about doing it that way is that to create two different objects with different materials, you just duplicate the type and assign the associate, associate the right material with each of the different types. If you ever see something that says by category with the brackets around it, that means it's going to defer to the higher level object style instead. Finally, we have the assigning materials by instance properties, kind of the deepest level. And that's nice in that you can go through and for every instance of a table, for every instance of a cabinet, go ahead and say that this table has a birch top, this one has a glass top, this one has a stone top, and you don't have to keep on defining new types. You can just sort of really be very, very specific, object by object, about what's going on. Okay. We looked a little bit about this whole issue of taking materials. We've been sort of duplicating materials as we go along, so I won't worry about that one too much. And then we have this whole issue of the render appearance. And what we've been doing for the most part is as we go through and we try to choose different render appearances, what we're doing is opening the materials dialog, we're switching to the render appearance tab, and then we're saying replace and going out to the library and finding something else that looks like what we want. Okay. And this whole issue about enable the use render appearance for shading, that was just keeping our render appearances and our shaded appearances in sync with each other. Now, this is all working fine until you finally get to the point where you say, you know, I've got an appearance that isn't in the library. I'd like to use that instead. So how can we incorporate that? And that gets to this issue of actually fine tuning the appearance, not only just choosing the appearance from the library, but actually pointing to your own image. Okay, or changing the scaling or the sizing or the rotation of an image to really get exactly what you want. And I'll switch back over here and show you how we might use that. For example, I'll all come on down here. I have these little painted surfaces. And oh, if I go through and render this U, for example, let me just kind of show you what that looks like. Oh, what will I do? Let me uh, render this. I'll say low for right now, because I don't really want to do it at too much of a level of detail. Um, let me turn on the region settings, because I don't really want to render too much. I'm just going to look at a specific material. So rather than sort of rendering everything, all I really want to render is a very small piece of it that really just shows me the part that I'm trying to change. So I'll bring that region very close. Take a look at what's going on. Maybe even zoom in a little bit closer. Beautiful. So we got some data to work with. Let's go ahead and render this and just take a look at how things are looking. So this is a painted surface. It doesn't really matter that it's a painted surface, because really what I'm more interested in now is the materials property. And the material that's painted on there is something called oh, Finishes Exterior Stone. Let's take a look at it, and we'll start playing around with it, change it around so it has a different appearance. Okay, this is the appearance that it's defined, defined to right now. Let's let it finish rendering. You'll see it's something that looks like, oh, I'll call it stacked stone. Okay, this is like dry stacked stone. We used to use this an awful lot back in the, uh, well, usually the mountain environments. But it's wherever you want the appearance of stone that's stacked up on a wall. It's a little bit hard to sort of see there. Maybe I even need to sort of bring that in a little bit closer. Oh, let me uh, show the model. Zoom out. I'm going to bring it in much closer because I really want you to sort of see the appearance of what I'm going after. Zoom in again. Okay, I'll just sort of ratchet that up a little bit. As I'm doing this, you notice what I'm trying to do is make a trade-off between the quality of the rendering and the size. So what I'm doing is I am keep on scoping it down 
and then turning on or adjust scoping the da down by sort of adjusting the region, then I can turn up the quality. What I'm trying to do is actually make sure that this number never gets too large, because this is the number that really tells you how much data you're going to be computing. Okay, if that starts getting over like one megabyte, it's going to take a long time. So try and keep that 500k, 600k. Don't let it get too large. If it does, you know, if it starts getting to be two megabytes, three megabytes, something like that, that's when you're going out and getting coffee. Okay, and coming on back. Okay, so this is not too bad. This is giving you a pretty good sense of what the dry stack stone looks like. Okay, and I'll let it go just a little bit further. I'll say, yeah, that's enough. I sort of have a pretty good sense of what that's like. Again, don't be afraid to cancel. You know, once you've sort of, you've gotten enough information to sort of understand what you were trying to understand, just cancel it, that's fine. Okay, that's the appearance it has right now. If that's not the appearance I want, let me see how we could change that. Okay, what I'm gonna do is go to materials. I will take a look at my finishes exterior stone. Take a look at the render appearance. There it is right now. If that's not what I like, I can try a different appearance. I could go to the library and choose one of the other ones. Oh, like Riverstone. I'll say OK. When I go back and render, we can see if we like that any better. It always does the same thing up front. It, the first 10% is just computing the model, kind of figuring out how much, the, how much lighting is appearing on each of the different surfaces. Then it goes back and maps the surface on top. So I'm looking at this stone surface, and you know, again, this, this is kind of looking 1960s-ish. That may not be what I'm having in mind. Okay, so if that's not the type of surface that I want, Okay, I'm going to try something different. Cancel that. Here's the deal. When I go back to materials and I take a look at what's available to me, and I say go to the library and take a look, there's really only so many appearances that are there. There may not be one that really has the appearance that I have in mind. Okay, but you may have some perfect thing that you have in mind that you want to apply, you just don't see it there. It turns out all these different library places are really just slots. You can think of them as just little placeholders for something that you want to put in there instead. So if you know that you're not going to use one of these slots, feel free to go ahead and change it with the appearance of something else that you want to use instead. For example, if Stone 4 is not something I'm going to use right now, let me just grab that slot. I'll say OK. This is kind of what it looks like right now. But if that's not what I want to use, let me change it. Okay, now, as you change your slots, it's only going to affect this one project. So you don't have to worry if you change your slots that it's changing anyone else's library or that it's changing all your projects. It's only changing this one. Okay, down here in the choices, you'll actually find that all these things, instead of using this travertine <coughs> cream sort of marble texture, everything really is determined by an image file. So if you'd like to use a different image file, all you need to do is go on out to the library. You can go ahead and find an image file. And this can be, oh, any image file you want. You could have downloaded these from the web. You could have got these from a manufacturer's catalog. You could have pulled these off your camera, whatever it is. But you're going to want to have a relatively dead-on view of the material, because it's going to try and map that material over the entire surface. Yeah, Aaron. So if you're using a thermal scan, huh? Oh no, okay, so let's talk about that. You know, JPEG or uh, PNG, either of those is fine. Most of your cameras will just take JPEG, and that's kind of A-OK. -okay. So what you gotta do is try and get as dead on as you can. If it's this wall here, try not to come at it from the side. See if you really can, you know, come at it just sort of dead on, okay? Because the better you can come dead on, you know, the closer it's gonna be. For some things like the cork texture, it doesn't really matter. For some things like a brick or a stone that you found on the walls of the quad or something like that, you know, it's pretty hard to get and get it dead on. So get, you know, and focus on some sample. It'd be nice to have a sample that's maybe oh six feet by six feet, eight feet by eight feet. You want to have a little bit of size to play with because if it's too small a sample, 
But even small variations in shadow quality, you can see because it's going to patch that pattern together. It's better to almost have more of the pattern to work with because then the, your, your overlap lines won't be so um, obvious. Okay. Then as you bring that in, if it's still not quite right, what you may want to do is go into Photoshop or go into even iPhoto or something like that and trim it up a little bit. Kind of really crop it down to what it needs to be and even twist it or distort it a little bit to kind of really flatten out the pattern. Okay, there's sort of a whole art to it, but it really kind of starts with that. So if it's from your camera, it takes a little more work. If you go to most manufacturers' websites and you want a standing steam copper roof, you'll find one. You just have to do a little bit of looking out and they'll give you some sample patterns. So I'm, I'm grabbing things from manufacturers' websites all the time. So that's kind of the easiest way. Then it's just like do a screen capture or something like that or you know, Command Shift 4 on your Mac or something and pull it right in. Okay. But sort of the more dead on, the better. And the bigger, the better, because then you have you know, your overlap. You won't see it as easily. Okay, I'm going to go flipping out to a piece of the library and kind of show you there's some materials that if you want to play with it now in sort of the session nine on the L drive, they're also on the K drive. You know, they're out in a lot of different places right now, but I've collected a lot of materials through the years. So let me kind of show you just some that I have. Oh, I'll go to my Revit folder, rendering images, and I have materials textures. So I have all sorts of stuff kind of hanging around there. Not too many bricks. I'm big on stone. Everyone was having oh, countertops made of granite a few years ago. So what did you do? You start having all sorts of different granite patterns. And those granite patterns I can choose. I, mean, I can scan an image or I can take a photograph of something and put your granite on your countertop. Yes? How much is the file size for that? You know, where did you get file size from? Oh, actually, they're just all over the place. Some of these are 300K. Yeah, they don't have to be very big. OK, where, on y where you would find it on yours, if you go to the L drive and you go into Cat's Glen and Session 9, you'll find something called, oh, it's, it should be called like Materials Textures or Materials Rendering. OK, go in there and you'll find it. It's also on the K drive. So under Revit Libraries, there's something called uh, Rendering Materials. You know, it's, it's always available to you. And you can get to that from you know, other spots on campus, too. But it's just kind of like my little random collection. And for going for different s types of materials, let me show you. And my stones, because people like to stone, you know, I got a lot of stones. Got stone veneers. I have a bunch of different patterns in here that came from Owens Corning. They make a lot of synthetic stone veneers. So I can choose different sort of stone, stone patterns. I can choose bricks. I can choose things like castle stone. I can choose things that look like uh, river rocks, kind of very rounded rocks like that. Let me show you what that would look like. I'll bring that in and apply it. Let me see if I can update the preview. Not too bad right now. For this one, one important thing to set is the notion of really what is the scale of that pattern. So you get to actually sort of say, is that a two-foot sample, a three-foot sample, a four-foot sample? That'll determine how big it actually sort of renders. Well, that's about a three-foot sample. Again, just sort of guessing. Was that? That's right. Big river rocks. Yeah. Say again? Oh, yes. What that meant is that if I clicked it again, that little kind of thumbnail which tries to show me how it would look, it would rescale it to be that three foot. It's, it's just it's telling me that it's not current. It, it will use the scaled image. Yes. Even though the preview wasn't right. Okay, so let's take a look at what our river rock looks like. See if we like that. OK, our river rock are these like rounded little stones. OK, and that may be OK if we like that appearance. Actually, what I tend to do when I use my own custom ones is I turn off the texture, the, this thing that says uh, the bitmap or the bump map. I usually turn that one off. 
because what that one does is it sort of overlays some additional information to try and cast better shadows. And if you don't have uh, the bump map to match the image file, then it'll just sort of give you kind of you know, spurious shadows, something like that. So let me, I'll, I'll turn, when I go back in, I'll show you where that is, or show everyone what you're talking about. What you need to do to make it work is you need to take your same picture and make a grayscale image of it. Because what it does is it uses the information about how gray you are to predict how deep the crevice is and cast a proper shadow. So when you're doing that, you're really getting good. When you can sort of go through and take your image, do the grayscale as a bump map, and kind of bring them together. Because then it not only sort of paints it on the surface, but in terms of how the shadows go into the crevices, it does a much better job of trying to offset it. So that's a really cool thing to do. Yes, or something. Just put it as two feet by two feet that now we can see the two. Exactly. You see my seams? Yeah, so it's it's got those little seams right here. That's just you know, a little bit of overlap. Exactly. If it was smaller, you probably wouldn't notice them, but it's kind of big. Okay. Let me change to one other type of material. Say, oh, for this again, finish exterior stone. Maybe I don't like that appearance. Oops, I don't even have to go back there. I'll just keep it as stone four. I'll just change the bitmap. And oh, an effect that we don't use so much here, but it's quite common in other parts of the world, is instead of going for, oh, these stone veneers that look like this, we can just put big tiles on the surface. For example, if you have slate or something like that, I can choose a pattern. Okay, once again, I had the issue of the scale. So let's talk about how we can use this scale. Those floor tiles, which are sort of a dead-on shot from a manufacturer's catalog, okay, are actually 12 by 12. But if I really want to simulate 24 by 24 or some other size, I can actually just put a false scale in there, and it'll just map the image to be a different size. So if I put 4 by 4, that'll go ahead and treat it as those are 12 inches. If I say that's 8 feet, It'll actually render the tiles as though they're two feet wide. So don't be afraid to do that. You can often take a material from a totally different application. I could take that cork material and apply it at a much bigger scale and create something very interesting as a wall texture. Okay, this whole issue down here, there's the bump pattern. And what I'm going to just actually turn that to none. That'll be a little bit clearer <coughs> in terms of what's going on. That's because since I don't have a bump pattern to go with that, it'd be better not to turn it on. Let me update my preview. Okay, that's sort of what it looks like. I could also put a rotation on there if I like. Adjust the brightness or darkness. If that's just looking a little too bright or too dark. I can sort of play with that. And when I have a material that I like, again, I'll render with that. OK, we'll see how that looks. So when it comes to materials and applying the materials, I just want to encourage you to play. It all starts with detective work. See if you can figure out what it is that's driving the material. And after that, there's really no right or wrong answer. Because as you render these things, and I'm not going to make a value call that says that, you know, I don't like your color scheme. You know, if, if you like that, in fact, you know, that's something I try to be very sensitive to. There's very different sensibilities about color and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, go ahead, find some materials that you want to apply, then just apply them well. Okay. You know, make sure that everything sort of is to some sort of scheme that you like. This is doing a bad job because of the 30 degree. It's giving me sort of an ugly seam right there. This is something where this pattern I probably shouldn't rotate. Because as I rotate it, you know, it's not doing a good job of matching up. So maybe I could go ahead and change that back again. Again, by materials. Switch it over. Bring it back to zero. Now if I was being good. I should have actually gone through, and uh, it would be nice if I actually had that turned on. So I, since that's a predominantly gray material, it'll render as gray, it'll shade as gray. You know, again, giving you a clue that as you're mapping, you're changing things. Okay, so we've been mostly focusing on materials and how we adjust those things. 
What I want to do for the last part of class here is really just instead focus on just the rendering settings and what you're changing on that side. Because material takes a little detective work, but after you get the hang of it, it's pretty much just finding the materials that you like and sort of tweaking their parameters to give you the appearance you like. Okay, let that thing finish up and then we'll go back. Okay, as it's finishing up, let me just go ahead and get started talking about the rendering stuff. Mm, again, I still got sort of an ugly seam there. If I actually think about it, this may be something where I am betting you that if I really investigate my model, I have a split in the wall right there. Okay, that even though the walls sort of they look like they're there, there's actually a split, so it's starting the pattern over again on the split. There's something weird like that going on. But yeah, my models, like your models, have lots of little little things in them that you don't sort of notice till later when they become important. Okay, let me go back out and let's take a look at the rendering settings and really how you can sort of play with some of those things. It all starts with this notion of really choosing the rendering quality and the output resolution. And as you choose the desired quality, you can go all the way from draft to best. Okay? And as you change the quality from draft to best, every time you ratchet it up, think of it as sort of as doubling the amount of time it's going to take to do things, because it's doing a lot more calculations. Okay? Resolution's also related in there, because the resolution really determines how much data has to be computed. So let me come back out here. Let me uh, close out of there. I'm going to go to my, oh, another one of my views. Zoom to fit. Okay. I'll turn on the rendering over here. You'll see the screen resolution of this image would give us 729 by 459 pixels, which is 1.3 megabytes, which is already getting to be on the big size. Okay. If I turn that up to a higher resolution, like the printer resolution, okay, it'll get up to 8.5 at 300 dpi, 2.1 at 150 dpi, or all the way up to 34 megabytes. Okay, so don't go ahead and render everything at 600 dpi. If you're having troubles with lighting, the resolution's not going to fix it. You know, so go ahead and think about where that is. Resolution is really only good in terms of really fixing these funny little jaggy edges and stuff like that. If you have a fine layer of detail, something very thin, and you're not quite seeing it, turning up the resolution will help that. Okay, but it's really just this issue of how many pixels are on the screen, and do you have enough pixels to re represent it. For the most part, stick with screen as you're working, okay, because that'll be fine enough. Even if those little railings don't quite look right yet, when you finally do turn it up, it will look right at that point. Trust it. It will actually do that way. You don't want to have to sit there and kind of suffer through the, uh, the waiting as it tries to render that stuff in great detail. Okay, The quality settings, low on up, in general, kind of keep on working with the lower quality ones. As you get going and you're just trying to figure out your materials, stay with draft and low. That's going to be fine enough. You know, when you're really starting to worry about the pattern, is the pattern quite right? You might get up to medium, but stay away from high and best. You don't really need to be at high and best for what you're doing until you're really ready to run that final one. Because when you go to high and best, okay, that's when you're going to go away for half an hour and wait for it. So yeah, don't, don't penalize yourself by having to wait for all that. Only render what you need to. And use the region to go ahead and really focus the rendering on really what's most important to you as you're going so that you're not really rendering things that you don't need to see. Okay, back over here. Okay, limit the region rendered. We sort of talked about that a little bit. Let's talk about the sun settings and what's available there. Because one of the critical things as you're doing your rendering is just getting the lighting right. Because lighting is sort of everything in terms of whether things are going to be too dark or too bright or just how it's going to play out. So let me show you where that works. Under lighting, your big choices are, is it first an exterior view or an interior view? Okay. Make very, be very careful to set that to exterior, interior. When you move inside, if it's set to exterior, it's going to really give you very, very dark images, because it's allowing that somewhere in this image, there might be the full sunlight. 
And so daylight or the lighting inside the building will be a very narrow range and you'll hardly see that lighting at all. So make sure you have interior versus exterior set right. On the exterior, honestly, daytime rendering, sun only is enough. Artificial lighting could be helpful if there was some lighting under the canopy that was sort of picking up a shaded area, kind of really trying to brighten that. But for the most part, sun will take care of what you want. Exterior artificial only, we'd use that if we did an exterior rendering and we were doing it at night. Okay, and you wanted to see the effect of the interior lights, kind of lighting up the windows or any exterior floodlights. Okay, interior, there we have the effect again, sort of whether you want to be lit by the sun coming in through the windows, whether you want to include the artificial lights, or if you want to only include the artificial lights, more of the nighttime rendering. So that's going to just help set the scale. For now, let's stay with sun only on the exterior. Okay, let's talk about where the sun is in the sky. There's two ways of going through setting that. You can either kind of manually set where the sun is in the sky, or you can actually set it by a time and a place and a location. So let me start by just setting it to like, oh, top right, for example. That's just, you know, we just manually pulled the sun out of the sky and quite independent of the project said, put it up here. And it's gonna put it relative to the view. So top right is up here, kind of shining down. And it'll always be there. It'll always be there. It'll always be there, which is inherently the problem of doing it this way. Because any time, day or night, or really in any view, it'll always be in the top right. Okay, and you can set this view by view, but when you just sort of manually put the sun, sun, sun somewhere, it is good for sort of figuring out where the shadows are gonna fall approximately, so you can sort of see what your overhangs look like, but you're gonna get inconsistency because the shadows you're gonna get are not really gonna be accurate for your site, and the shadows will be the same on all sides of the building. Okay, so, you know, that's not really quite right. It's okay for creating a quick rendering. And if, you, if your building is a spec building and might be anywhere on the face of the earth that you have no control over the orientation, that could be okay. But if you're trying to be sensitive to your site, let's see what's going on here. Jacob, I think our glass block wall <laughs> is rendering as clear right there. As you would like it to. As you would like it to. Well, there you go. Maybe I should unpaint that wall. Okay, sun's kind of coming, oh, kind of from up here right now. That's why this surface is bright and this surface over here is dark. That surface is just sort of transparent. That's why you can't see it. Okay, notice the shadow of the overhang is doing a little bit over there. Let's shift that over. We'll say sunlight from the top left instead. Kind of check that out. That's kind of good. Well, it's defined for this purposes as a specific time at June twenty second. You know, and it's I don't know if it's if like five in the afternoon or when it is. It's or if it's just right at noon. Actually, someone knows what the real definition of that is. And you'll help me in a minute. But it's uh yeah we'll we'll actually look at how it's defined. So in this case, I said sun from the top left. It's going to come. Okay, it's coming from over here. Notice that the left side of the curtain wall is sort of illuminated. The left side of like the little entrance is illuminated right now, but this other side is in the darkness. Okay, now that all seems like well and good, but it's actually much nicer to go through and choose a sun settings that are appropriate for your location and your project orientation. So let's show you how you do that. There are these other settings like summer solstice, winter solstice. We could take a look at those and let's edit them, see how they look. Summer solstice is 6.22 at 9 a.m. Winter solstice is 12.22 at 9 a.m. Spring equinox is at 10. I had no idea it was at 9 in the morning. I would have guessed in the afternoon, so I would have been wrong. <laughs> okay, but we're gonna set some of our own here instead. Notice we can actually set a still image. That's a specific time of day. We can also create movies, if you like, to actually see the effect of the sun and the shadows on a single day from a time in the morning to a time in the afternoon. Okay. We can also go ahead and do multi-day movies if you want to do a sun study and sort of see through the year at a specific time of the day, how are my shadows affecting other buildings? 
care how are the shadows affecting me. So it really depends what you're studying right now. These sort of solar studies are actually very, very nice, especially on the interior of buildings, because if I do, I can choose that optimal time when I have really good sunlight in my living room and everything looks fine, but it may not really be very accurate. You know, because as we switch to different times of the year or switch to the day, that sun's going to keep on changing. And you sort of care about not that one optimum time, it's sort of the overall effect. Can you show us how to run a single Yeah. Well, let me, I'll, let me do that next time for you. Okay, so I can just finish up with the, the sun and that stuff. But yeah, I'll definitely get that next time. Remind me next time, because we're going to do It's sort of another type of movie, like a walkthrough movie. I'll show you that. Okay. To define a time and place, let me do this. Let me, oh, I'll just grab one of them. It doesn't really matter which one. I'm going to duplicate it. I'll say that it's a Palo Alto afternoon. I'm going to say it's some sort of place as opposed to directly. I will choose a place. I can go through and either enter some coordinates in terms of the latitude and longitude, and I can put whatever ones I want in here. If you want a place that isn't defined automatically, you can put your own latitude and longitude in here. Palo Alto actually happens to be in here. So let's choose it. Okay. What it's going to do is, based on a latitude and a longitude now, it'll understand what the path of the sun is and has some files that will then determine for different times and days. So on 1019 at 415 in the afternoon, okay, we can sort of see what the effect of the sun would be on this building. We'll say OK. I will render that. And we can create several different time settings. We can say Palo Alto at 9 AM, Palo Alto at 3 AM. Pal no, that would be very dark. 3 PM. We can say um, Palo Alto in June as opposed to Palo Alto in October. Or run a movie, like you want to do. Either way, to try and create sort of these different sort of sun studies. But go ahead and set the sun accurately for what you want. And we will get accurate shadows cast sort of relative to those things. Actually, notice the sky is very much darker. Okay, And that is sort of appropriate if you think about it. For this time of year, around this time, the sky is starting to get dark. It's almost sunset in the scheme of things. So yeah, that's what's going on. It's actually sort of interesting. The horizon's even sort of yellowy or something like that. It's kind of late afternoon. The sky is trying to affect things because there's a very, yeah, I'm not sure if you notice it, the sun looks different in the morning than it does in the afternoon. Okay, it has a different sort of tint to it and a different warmth to it. Yeah, and that's what's sort of going on. So this is shadows that are appropriate for this time of the afternoon. Okay, if I would change that to instead say it's not going to be the afternoon, but I'm going to do the morning. I'll duplicate that. And I'll say that's going to be, oh, at 10 AM. Let me run that. And I'm actually quite surprised. No one's asked the question, you know, in your <laughs> Jacob, in your skeptical way. Uh, like, you know, you know, how do we know what orientation the building has in terms of how the sun is actually related to the building? Okay, and that's the next thing I want to show you. Because as we lay out this project, you know, got one, Aaron? Yeah. Well, actually, we can adjust that. There's a couple things going on. Yeah, no, it is very dark. I'll tell you what's going on here is actually at 10 in the morning, the sun's on the other side of the building. So I'm looking at it relatively dark. But let's talk about how you can fix this, because it's not actually quite appropriate. We ran this rendering. It's actually not quite so bad on my screen. These screens that you're looking at are a little bit dark in terms of, you know, they should probably tune them in terms of the brightness. but. There's something that we can do to post-process an image right here, and that's a very useful thing, where we can adjust the exposure. If the idea is that what you're seeing just overall, it just feels too dark, it's relatively right, it's just sort of absolutely too dark. What I can do without even re-rendering re it, I can just uh, pull the settings down and try to just brighten up the entire image a little bit. Exactly. 
Well, let's see if we can actually turn the highlights down, the highlights being the brightest parts. So I'm getting a little sky back now. There's a funny game you play here with these in terms of the <coughs> overall exposure, the brightness of the highest parts, the brightness of the shadowiest parts, the brightness of the middle tones. And by tweaking these, you can actually get quite a bit of light in or out. In this case, that's probably sort of appropriate. I'd say it feels more like 8 in the morning or something like that, where the sky is kind of hazy. There's some light that's reflecting some ambient light, but I don't see a lot of direct sunlight right now. There's also this issue of saturation. Can again tune this in terms of whether you want sort of an intense image, kind of add a little more color to it, okay, or that's way they oversaturate it, or I can bring that back down to a gray ear image, okay. But that's available to us. Again, we don't necessarily need to play with that so much in terms of the exterior ones, unless it just turns out to be really dark or light. When we get to the interior, you're going to find that's very critical to play with those settings because you'll often create something and it's going to look incredibly dark and you say, oh, my lights have no effect. What's going on? I better put in more lights. And no, it's not that you need more lights. It's just we need to sort of adjust that range a little bit and really tune in on the part where the, val the light can actually be found. And then we'll do a better job with that. Okay, let me go ahead and rotate that project around just to show you that. And then I'll show you one or two last things in terms of finishing up today. Okay, that project, it's kind of hanging around. You're thinking, okay, great. This is the way I'm looking at it. Clearly, this must be the north up here. And this is the east over on this side, and the west is over here, because that's where the project north is. And the south, you know, and, and you know that's not true, because if you've, or, yeah, well, as you're watching me move my shadows around, you, the afternoon seems like the sun's all coming over here. The morning, it's not really coming from here. It seems to be coming from over there. So you guys should have a clue that, hey, the actual orientation of the project and the project orientation may be a little bit different. Okay, and it is true here. North on this project is actually over on the left-hand side. So there's project orientation, and when you're worried about the sun, you have to worry about the true orientation. Okay, you only have to set it once, but after you do, all the views will inherit it. But go ahead and just get yourself set up this way once, and let me show you how you do it. Let me duplicate my view. That's going to be the easiest way to do it. And I'm actually just going to call that something real obvious like true north. Okay. I'll take a look at that view, and I'm going to change one of its view properties. The property that I'm going to change is actually the issue of is that project sh or is that view showing me the project north or the true north? So it, right now it's showing me project north. Most of my views I tend to define that way. But if I say true north instead and say OK, it'll actually rotate it around and show me this is actually the way the odd project is really oriented. So in my true north view, OK, north is at the top, east is at the side, west is at the left side, south is down below. Okay, so this is the actual orientation of the project. Yes, right up. Ah, let's, let's show you how you change this now. Okay, if you want to go ahead and you have your project and you want to rotate it somehow to be in you know, the proper orientation is true north, what you do is as follows. Under manage, you'll actually find something called under locations and project location, there's something called position. And this is where we can either we can rotate our project north, okay, which just sort of shifts it around in terms of how it lays out on the sheets, but doesn't change it uh, for the sun. Or we can change the true north, and the true north is the one that will change the position of where the sun will be. Okay, If I say rotate true north, what I'm going to do is as follows. I'm actually going to swing an arc, and what I want to do is just rotate the whole site so that north is pointing at the top. So. If I want to rotate the side, I can swing an arc. Okay, and now north is back over here. Okay, west is over here, east is over here, south is o or south is over here. So now, if I go through and kind of run the afternoon rendering, what's going to happen is the western sun is not just going to highlight this side of the building; it's going to sort of highlight this whole side of the building here instead. Okay, so 
go ahead and get your project north oriented the way you want. Sometimes it can be sort of very counterintuitive. But I'll keep that true north view around. Notice it really didn't change anything. That still looks just the same. Okay, but if I go to my exterior and I say, let's go ahead and re-render that. Let me switch it over to the afternoon. Okay, you're going to find that the shadows cast differently because of what's going on, because now we're oriented properly. Okay, few final points, or one big final point, and that is, okay, we've done good in terms of materials, we're doing good in terms of adjusting our rendering settings. One of the last things you have to sort of worry about for the exterior views is just sort of dressing the view, going ahead and making sure that your view doesn't look like some building sitting out in the middle of a big concrete field. Okay, and how do you go through and do that? Well, it often starts with this whole notion of putting planting in and stuff like that. That's actually one of the quickest, easiest ways. Just put some plants around the building and it'll start to have scale. But we can also put some things in there like, oh, people. There's a little person standing there, right? We're like getting ready to walk into the building. We can also put cars in there. We can go ahead and add things to it to kind of give it a little more context. Aaron. In, I'll answer that like in, in two parts. In Revit 2010, no. In Revit 2011, yes. Okay, that was one of the changes they made between the two. So if you were, oh, now you're thinking. So if you download Revit 2011 to your personal machine, and I didn't download it here because we don't have access to it in the lab, you know, then you can go ahead and put in you know, the beautiful seascape. You can do that, you know, that San Gregorio view, like looking out across the waters. You can put whatever you want in the background. And instead of just having these blue skies with a few clouds, you can actually get that other image. That can be especially effective if you're doing interior renderings, because you can sort of be looking out the windows and seeing what you'd see out there. So you know, very, very powerful when you're doing that. OK, my shadows are a little different. That part's fine. Let's go ahead and talk about plants and all that so we can get you finished up. OK. So, oh, I'm going to switch back to my first floor plan view. I'm going to turn on the planting. Notice in this view you don't actually see the planting. So I'm going to go visibility graphics and turn on plants as a category. OK, great. You notice there are some plants actually sort of set up here. There's little guys all around the edge of the building. These are little shrub elements. If I kind of come over here, you'll find there's some big tree elements kind of hanging around up front. These all trees have properties. They have sort of a name. They also have a render appearance. This is a red ash tree. You can take a look at what it looks like. And you can find all sorts of different trees, birch trees, elm trees, hemlock trees, oak trees, all sorts of funny trees in there. Okay? And they have different seasons to them, You know, whether you want to have a fall tree or kind of have a more of a uh, like wintertime tree. You know, the trees are pretty smart. They'll lose their uh, foliage. They'll try to adapt themselves to the appropriate amount of foliage for the right time of year. Okay, Choosing fall just means that you really are quite interested in having those fall colors, like the golds and the, or ambers and things like that, as opposed to the green colors. Let me actually bring in a different type of tree, though, so that we can actually just show you from scratch. Okay. There are deciduous trees, there are conifer trees, and let me load up one of the other ones. Let me uh, insert, load a family, and I'm going to go out to, it's under the planting folder. I will choose, there's conifer trees, again those are pines and Christmas trees and fir trees and things that aren't going to lose their leaves. Deciduous are the ones that are actually going to go ahead and like uh, lose their leaves. Fall really being the ones that are very ambery and kind of look good in fall renderings. Tropical trees are ones that you see a lot around here. Tropical trees include all the palm trees and stuff like that. Let me bring in some palm trees. Let's take a look. I'll go to home. I'll place some components. Well, I got there under my tropical trees. Australian tree fern. Buddha belly bamboo, golden mele palm, fiber banana, windmill palm, traveler's palm. Let's put a traveler's palm in. 
We'll throw some of them on the sidewalk. Don't complain. I'll go back to my exterior ground towards the entrance. You'll see them kind of hanging around there, just waiting to be rendered. Okay, they show up in kind of these kind of ugly gray views, but when I render those, those will start looking better. Okay, if you need to create new types that aren't in there, what you're going to do is choose a tree. We can take its type properties. I can duplicate it. I'll call it a Stanford palm. Actually, we have a lot of different type of palm trees on campus. But let's see if we can find one that looks like grass palm, golden melee palm, windmill palm, not a traveler's palm. I think it was canary palms. I don't really see one that's actually sort of there. Hmm. Do that one. That actually looks pretty good. I can give it a height. Oh, I want that to be uh, 25 feet tall. And when I go through and put it in, I'll put a couple more on this side. Where are you? Oh, there you are. And I'll copy a few of those over. Beautiful. Okay, so far so good. Okay, add a few things like palm trees or whatever it's going to take to give your building some life. Okay. Also, we can go through and put pieces, things like vehicles in there, or site furniture, benches, like tables and chairs, planters, things like that. Let me just shortly show you, really quickly show you vehicles. I like vehicles. We got some good ones in there. Let me, oh, to make this work, I'm going to load. What I'm going to do is first turn on two different categories in visibility graphics. One called entourage. That's where people are going to come from. I'm also going to turn on site. So things like sometimes vehicles are lo loaded under site. And show you where those come from. So I'm going to go through and place a component. What I'm going to first do is load a family. I can go out there and in the standard library I'll find, oh, under site. They got some nice things under, well, no, they're not there. Where are they now? Are they under entourage? They hide things from me. Van, semi truck, those don't look very interesting. Beetle, that might be okay. But I'm instead going to go to the 110 library, because in the 110 library, hidden away for you, just where you might like to find them, you'll find the Porsche 911, or the Viper, or the Camaro. So you're selling your concept. If, you're con if your owner is someone who might want to have a 911 sitting in the driveway, why not put one in there for him as opposed to the Toyota Camry? Okay, so go ahead and like, uh, you know, you, you can set the stage to create the effect you want. Okay, let me, oh, there it is. I'll put it in the handicap space. That'll be really considerate of me. <laughs> okay, I can rotate that around. Because when I'm this important, it's very important, I can take up three spaces. Okay, and I can go back to my uh, first floor plan view. Very final thing I want to show you for today is this whole notion of, there's that car, people. Okay, people, you, my little guy over here, you probably haven't been paying much attention to him in terms of what's going on, but people are available here too. So let's go ahead and put some people in this plan too. People are actually considered entourage. Okay, let me kind of go up there and let me turn that on. Visibility graphics, it is turned on up there. Let's put some people up at the balcony so they can sort of talk to these guys. Okay, up here on the balcony, you know, it looks so sterile. Who knows people can stand up there until we put some in there. Let me place some components. I'm gonna load something. People are actually listed under entourage and you find the male and the female characters. Let me grab them both, just so I can get them in here both. Sure. Let's take a look. Under the females, we have Cynthia, Florence, Lisa, Tina, Union, and Kathy. <laughs> or Alex, Dwayne, Jay, and Laurent. Okay. Each of the different people has a different character and a personality. So 
Cynthia, I believe, is the one who, she's a rather prim and proper gal in a business suit, sitting down with her briefcase, looking like she belongs in an office. <laughs> Yin Yin, however, she's sarong ready and ready, you know, she's ready for the beach. She's ready to party. So we're going to put her up here. As I put Yin Yin up here, okay, Yin Yin actually has, has a little bit of shadow casting. This little arrow right there, the tip right there, that's who she, where she's looking at right now. I'm going to go ahead and, oh, I'll rotate her around a little bit so she is kind of looking over the balcony a little bit. Now, I don't want her to get lonely, so I'm going to place a component also for, uh, we'll give her someone to hang out with. Who do you think? Alex, J. Who? Laron. Okay, Laron wins. Here's Laron. We'll go ahead and rotate him into place. So they're having a nice conversation. OK. Let's go ahead and do some rendering. OK, you see them up there? They're kind of hiding. They're right there. OK, let's go ahead and render the scene and see how it looks. Well, we could. Yes, I can. Uh, oh, actually. And what do I have to do here? Let me think. Let me think. Let me not. It, it's, I think it's because of the way I'm set up right now. I think I should be able to pull navigation wheel. There it is, up and down. OK. Yeah, but see, no, exactly. So we're going to have to do a little looking, too. How about that? Nice composed view. Okay, compose your view. It's important, you can. Let's go back and we'll say, uh, render this view. We'll leave the sun set the way it is. I'll even turn this up to medium so we get a little bit better. Say okay and let it rip. Okay, we'll finish there. If you want to stick around and watch it for just a few minutes, it'll take probably about two or three minutes for it to get through this thing. But what it's going to do is, it's going to flesh out that tree, give us a nice rendering on the car, hopefully with some nice uh, reflective surfaces. You get to see Yin Yin and Laron hanging, having their conversation as, uh, I'm not sure who that is, goes into the building. But it's all about just composing a view. And these are all just different things that will really help you with that. Oh, there comes the Porsche. The Porsche is a red one. Well, that can be too. Let it come through. This is funny. You, you want to see this, right? You want to know what Laurent and Union look like. <laughs> uh, you'll become old friends with them. So as you go through and pick a picture or start using people and stuff like that, be aware that they do have sort of different attitudes and the you know, yeah, use the appropriate people. Don't put Yin Yin in the middle of an office, or you can. It sort of depends. Or don't put Cynthia on the beach. How about that? <laughs> okay. Oh, we're like that. Actually, what you need to do is, as you render each view, say Save to Project. Oh. And then it actually creates a rendering object, which is just a bitmap locked in time. At the same, at the same uh, window? Yes, it'll, make, it'll, make ex it'll copy exactly what you're seeing on the screen in. Okay. Whenever you want to show the rendering, you can automatically upload it. Get oh, actually, multiple what you, yes. And then each of those renderings are objects. You can place them on sheets. So you can even have different renderings showing different materials or different times of day. And you can put them all on a sheet together. You could drag this rendering into a sheet. Exactly. Or actually, what we'll do is we'll save it to the project. that will put it in the browser. And then you can drag it into the sheet. You're right. I, I, I won't be able to talk it away by saying it's just reflecting the sunshine. <laughs> On, oh, in terms of the, sh the shading or the sunshine? It's really just the scale at which it's looking at the light. So exterior includes like the full range of the sunlight. Interior makes it much narrower so that you, it sort of takes the limited light that's there and spreads it much further. So you sort of see more detail in that limited light. <laughs> It'll. It'll, it'll, for low light situations, it'll bring out more detail you know, within the limited light that's available. Okay, and that's explicitly what we're going to play around with on Thursday. Okay. So here we go. We have, oh, there's Yin Yin, there's Laron, they're hanging. I think that's Dwayne who's going into the building, but 
you know, very quickly we've sort of started transforming our, our picture as a story now. It's not just sort of a picture sitting out in a parking lot. <laughs> 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 She's so